a safe space for St. Louis to learn about soccer. This is Soccer 101 with Michelle Smallman and Moon Valjean. Welcome back into Soccer 101. It is the safe space for St. Louis to talk about soccer. Michelle Smallman and Moon Valjean are here. And Moon City off to an historic start, an undefeated start. But unfortunately, they suffer their first loss of the season last week. Yeah, it's a bummer. But, um, I mean, nobody's perfect, right? No, almost, no. almost perfect there. Uh, but what a start. What a start. Nobody expected this. Not, not even like diehard you know, St. Louis City fans and all of us that were so excited. Nobody expected this sort of historic run. Uh, five and zero, oh, freaking incredible! I still think it's something like four hundred minutes, um, and still going that we have not allowed a goal in the run of play. Yeah. Um, so that's a spectacular stat as well. There's still plenty of stats to defend, including the fact that we are ahead in the West and still on top of the board as far as supporter shields, um, uh, running goes. So we're we're top of the charts there. We're going uh, going up against the Sounders this weekend, and they're second in the West. So this is going to be a heck of a match, a lot of fun. Uh, they have, I think they're 4-1-1. One one. Um, so they have a draw under the belt, which is why they are down behind us in the points. But, man, I'm so excited. I think we're going to learn a lot about this team this week. It's all great when you're winning and you're selling out at home and it's all sunshine and we're praising the team nonstop. But after you suffer your first loss, you're going into a very tough environment in Seattle at Lumen Field. And you are going up against, as you mentioned, your toughest opponent in the Western Conference who's looking to jump you in the table with three points. So how is the team going to respond, especially going into a tough environment against a tough opponent? This has always been a worrisome match even before um, our first five wins. Yes. Uh, because the Sounders uh, had a heck of a season last year, you know, their CONCACAF run uh, and all of that. And, and, of course, their energy, their fan base – uh, their stadium, the the whole thing is a hard place to go and win, especially as a as a as a new team, and as a now rival team as far as the points and the table goes. I think what our team has shown, and we've talked about this before, that's been so impressive in, the, in these last five games, is the composure, their mm-hmm. ability to bounce back, their uh, uh, their ability to be behind a goal or two and be able to come back and still have that that composure and that solid team. So I don't, I'm not really worried about that. Win, lose, or draw. I just want a good match, mm-hmm. and I think we'll present a good match. It, it'll be interesting to see what um, formation Coach Carnell goes with and who he's going to start out there because he's used a lot of different options these last couple couple matches. So uh, that's going to be fascinating. But, again, win, lose, or draw, I'm just really excited. This is the top two teams in the West going against each other. Cool. And when we looked at the schedule ahead of the season, did we think that City would be in this position at this point? No, we didn't. So it's amazing that we've arrived at this point. I also am looking for f- some fight out of this team. It's been interesting during the season, Moon. A lot of their victories have come from behind. We've seen yeah. them have that fight oftentimes in game. And I'm wondering how that translates after a loss. Uh, well, we're going to need a fight for sure, uh, especially on the defensive end. Obviously, it was a defensive mistake that cost us the game uh, against Minnesota. And if you're looking at the Sounders, and you'll have to check my numbers here, but I think they have 12 goals in total, and eight of them come from one guy, and that's Morris. So this is going to be a holy smokes, watch this guy. Watch what this team does around this guy, how they're feeding them the ball, or how they're using them to draw defenders. Um, so this is going to be a real test, and it's exciting. This is an exciting time to see what our back four can do, to see what Berkey can do mm-hmm. as far as captaining the the ship, captaining the field. Um and I'm really looking forward to this game. Again, I hate to be that guy, but win, lose, or draw, I just want a good match. I want to see St. Louis's response to the loss and response to playing a top table team. You know, the Sounders are no joke. They are not, and uh, research has returned with the numbers. Seattle, in fact, does have 12 goals on the season compared to 15 for City. Yeah, and eight of them, I think, are coming from one guy, Morris, on fire, on fire fire so defend that cat (laughs) game plan circle his number (laughs) defend him (laughs) yeah it's gonna be fun to see what they do okay well moon is it time for the word of the week yeah you know uh we skipped it last time and i wanted to talk about uh futsal because my daughter who by the way is going to be a freaking professional soccer player oh i can't wait Um, to share on she is incredible and she plays futsal a lot of times because it's growing in the states it's grown in the states for um it's been huge in brazil and south america it's largely credited to one of the big reasons why some of the Brazilian players in the past, the Ronaldinhos and that, those kind of guys, have such ridiculous foot control. It's like the ball sticks to their foot. 
and it's because of the futsal play that really started down there. And I just wanted to uh, go over the word itself. Futsal is the FIFA-recognized form of small-sided indoor football. The word is actually a contraction of the Spanish football sala. Uh, it's played between two teams who each have five players on the pitch at any one time with rolling substitutes and a smaller ball than soccer. It's actually harder. It's less bouncy. It almost has like a like a dead bladder, like a like a deflated bladder in it. Um, and it literally translates to like hall or lounge soccer. But man, it's all about the foot skills. Oh, so, so you have to control it differently. You really have to control it differently. And it makes it all about the little foot skills and, and quick passes and that kind of stuff. So it is a really good training game within the game of football. So you mentioned your daughter is into this. Are there leagues around town? Is it something oh, that yeah. people get involved in that way? It has grown throughout the United States. I don't know the stats, but I know that it, it hit pretty heavy about 10, 15 years ago. And a lot of the youth leagues um, during their off seasons are throwing these futsal teams together with either their entire squad or dividing them into, dividing them into two to really get that training for the, the foot skill, the footwork stuff. Is it kind of like pickleball where it's one of these fast-growing sports Yeah, you that's know, kind of under the radar? I, I mean, pickleball is now coming yeah. to the forefront, but it kind of reminds me of that with the hardcore and how it seems like people are really liking it and it's picking up steam. That blew up so, so quickly because I think so many people had Ex- access to it. It was such an accessible sport that and anybody could do. Helped, I think. You yeah, know, we were foot, looking for stuff like that to do. Futsal, I would see it more of uh, as a utility. Like oh, pe- okay. People really started getting into it because they saw the benefits it was giving to their youth programs, Got to it. their teams, and all that. Um, I was playing it because I was playing in an old guy league when I went through Utah. My buddy had a team. And he was fun. like, "You got to, you got to play with us." And it is fun, but man, it's um, it's different. It's hard on the knees, that's for sure, for an old rock star guy. Um, but it's a it's a it's a fun sport, and a lot of people that even know it or play it never really knew what the word meant. They just assumed it was something about indoor soccer, basketball court soccer, something like that. So I thought it was a fun word to explore. It was, and that was. Should we do our little song? The word of the week. The word of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Futsal word of the week. Okay, thank you, Moon. Should we get to some emails? Yes, please. Okay, well let's head on over to the email, and you can always shoot us an email if you have a question about soccer, about city, if you have some comments, if you just want to say what's up. Hit us at asksoccer101 at gmail.com. And this moon actually comes from Joe. It is a two-part question. He says, Michelle and Moon, you've mentioned a couple times he's a number X or he fits into the number Y. Obviously, it's not the number on the jersey. It's something to do with the formation on the pitch. Can you explain what slash how numbers represent the player positions? So you wanted to attack that one and then we'll go back to Joe's second question? Yeah, and I'll just talk about it from experience. I started noticing that in middle school and high school and coaches start giving you, when when coaches start giving you your numbers and you're not necessarily picking your numbers, you know, because every kid has their favorite. I'm 11 or or I liked Ted Williams, so I want to be three, or, you know, whatever yeah. it was. Um, but you always saw, like, Pele was 10, and then you always saw this guy was 10, or this guy was nine, and the goalies are ones mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. zeros or whatever it may be. So, yeah, it does has, have a significance. I'm not sure exactly where the history of it started, but typically you will see the low numbers, the twos, the threes, the fours, the fives, our defenders. Your number 10 isn't always necessarily the best player, but really is usually the anchor, typically a midfielder, sometimes a striker, but you're usually seeing like an attacking midfielder being the 10 in the center of the pitch, really being the playmaker and the anchor of the team. Sometimes a talisman, sometimes not. Which um, we learned in a previous pod. Exactly what that right. means. That was the word of the week. Yes, it was. A few weeks ago. Uh, your Ronaldos, your number sevens, and those kind of guys, you will see them being pretty much attackers, left wingers, right wingers. Uh, or attackers. Also, number nines. Typically, your number nines are selfish striker <laughs> only. They're not coming back. They're not your tens. They're not the playmakers uh, per se in the midfield. They are the guys that, as soon as they get the ball, they're not looking to pass. They're looking to score. That's your number nine. Your true. If you hear somebody say it's a true number nine, that is a um, a goal scoring, just a goal attacking machine. Selfish, going to take it anytime he can or she can. And um, so, yeah, the, the numbers do have significance. Typically, if you see somebody coming in and they're a 20 something, they're higher numbers, those are second squad guys that are kind of like working into the team. And they may earn a 10, 11, a 7, a 9. When Marcus Rashford came in with uh, Manchester United, he was a 19. Nice. That was his number um, on, the, on the second squad. And when he, made first, when he made first squad, he wore 19 for quite some time. And then he earned himself a better number, mm-hmm. as, as you say. Um, so, yeah, you'll see typically like the captains will either be the goalies, number ones, mm-hmm. two, something like that, 
or the number 10s in that center attacking midfield position? So I have a little history. I went to MLS.com and they have this little breakdown of shirt numbers and how they originated in soccer. So they were formally introduced in 1928 in an English game between Arsenal and Sheffield Wednesday. On that day, one team wore numbers 1 through 11, the other wore 12 through 22. By 1939, the English Football League introduced a system where both teams wore numbers 1 through 11 on the field and each number number, as Moon just laid out, corresponded to a certain position. So as Moon mentioned, goalies, typically a number one. Defenders, number two is often the right back. Number three, traditionally the left back. Four and five, traditionally belong to the starting center backs. Midfield, number seven, typically worn by a winger, a player who boasts offensive talent and supports the main striker. Yep. Number 11 typically denotes a winger. Number 8 is a jersey of a central midfielder. Number 10, as Moon already told you, is almost always an attacking midfielder. Now when we go to the offensive side of the ball, the number 9 usually given to a team's first-choice striker. So, Moon, you were dead on there. I remember growing up, I idolized Mia Hamm. My girl was a number 9. Yep. She was a very classic number 9. So, hopefully that gives you a little bit more um, intel into why certain players are wearing certain numbers. And when Moon says, if you're going to wear a number 10, I need to see X, Y, Z out of you. you He's saying that number is reserved for an attacking midfielder. And if you're wearing that number, there are certain expectations of you. 100%. You said it perfectly. All right. Well, let's go to the second part of Joe's question. He said, also regarding jerseys, the number 10 seems to be worn by the best player on a team. Is that an oversimplification are there any numbers not allowed? And is there a pecking order on who gets to pick their number? He says, thanks and keep up the good work. Three of five stars. So hopefully after we give him these explanations, that bumps it up to five of five stars. Yeah, or at least three and a half. Yeah, come on. Stars. Give us a little bit of a bump there. Um, okay, let's attack that a, a couple different ways. I don't know if there are any numbers that are not allowed. I think there were some leagues that were not allowing like double zeros or like weird numbers like that. Um, but I'm not really sure right now. I bet you it does vary slightly from league to league. Um, as far as the 10 goes, does it always denote the best player? Ah, uh, you, you might think that because like a Messi would wear a number 10, right? Yeah, right. And, and the, the Pele's, the Messi's, the, all, all those guys. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess if you want to oversimplify it, if you have to oversimplify it, sure. Look at number 10 first and see what they're doing. They're maybe the captain, they're typically the captain, or like I said, the playmaker, the anchor. There's mm -hmm. a lot of expectation put on number 10. Yes. If you consider the highest goal scorer on the on the team, the best player, then you're probably looking at a 10 or a 9 mm -hmm. or a 7 or an 11 or some somebody like that um, playing a true striker or just like the selfish striker sort of position, which is usually is not going to be a number 10. So really, I guess it's subjective on what you think is the best player out there. Because yes. like I said, um, typically I want my 10s to not always be the heroes. But when you take them away and you sell them to a different team or they go to a different team, they're so noticed that you never realized why that 10 was that 10. You, you know what I mean? Why that For player sure. wasn't the number 10. Um, so it just depends on how you're looking at it, really. Um, are there dedicated numbers going in? Um, so we'll take the Ronaldo thing. When Ronaldo went back to United, I believe there was someone wearing seven. It might have been Martial or, or somebody. And Ronaldo is a historic seven. I mean, every shoe he's got, every piece of underwear he sells, it's, it's like, CR7. It's like Tom Brady, TB12. Exactly right. So it is a thing where he can go in there, and I don't know if you can so demand that you have a, a jersey number. But if it's, if it's a guy like that coming in, it's usually uh, a matter of respect where somebody will hand you the jersey um, or, or give you the number back or something like that, even even though they've been playing that role for some time. There's a lot of players that make a big deal about it, too. I'm sure Ronaldo, I don't know if he makes a big deal about it, but I'm sure it was a big deal. Uh, the Ibrahimoviches of the world that are big, giant personalities, yeah, yeah. you know, they're probably carrying a number wherever they go, and they expect to, no matter who's been there, no matter who's had that number. Uh, so that's, a, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting dynamic, actually, to see from team to team with some of these personalities and what those numbers may mean to them. Yeah, it's 
kind of an ego check for some people if they're currently wearing that number and then a Ronaldo comes in, you're not going to be better or more revered than a Ronaldo. So yeah. what do you do in that moment? Uh, a lot of players often will buy it from another player. Like I know a lot of quarterbacks, if they come to a new team and someone has their number, they'll they'll give them a gift. Here's a Rolex or something. Oh, give me wow. my number, you know? And there's some bartering that goes on. But Again, if it's if it's somebody to the caliber of a Tom Brady and he goes to the Bucks, you're going to give him number twelve. You're just yeah. going to. And um, for Joe's question about is it worn by the best player on a team, number ten? Well, I would imagine if you're building a team. When we talk about this, sometimes I like to compare it to other sports for some of our sports listeners who might be listening. When you are building an NFL team, what's the number one position you want to build? A quarterback. Then what do you want to do? You want to give him a weapon. You want to give him a wide receiver. I imagine when you're building a soccer team, you're thinking about an attacking midfielder. That's one of the first positions that you want to fill and you want to make sure that that position on the field is really steady and accounted for. So it might not be what you consider the best player on the team, but it's certainly likely going to be one of the most important players on the team, therefore denoting a number 10. Yeah, definitely a central piece in the strategy and building around that number 10. So, yeah, I guess it is subjective, but you're right. When you're building something, you're building it around somebody, and typically you do have a 10 in mind before anybody else. I would imagine a 10, a 9, a goalkeeper. Those are probably some of the things you're thinking about first, right? Yeah, depending on the leagues, too. And we've talked about how unpredictable and ridiculous the uh, the MLS can be and how weak the defenses are uh, as, the, as the teams go down, as the league goes down. And it's those weak defenses that make some – Pretty wild matches and pretty wild um, stories throughout the MLS. So I don't know if I were, if I were building a team, I don't know if I would really try to have like the strongest defense and play a, a, a an old school Chelsea sort of park the bus, just focus on not letting goals in, or if I would just uh, do what we seem to have done and come out trying to have a solid back, but but really push uh, push forward and have this crazy counterattacking sort of sort of thing. So I guess it depends on the league and, and what you're after or who you get for a number 10. That's true. Well, thank you, Joe, for the email. Again, if you're listening to this, you have questions, comments, concerns, want to say what's up, hit us up at asksoccer101 at gmail.com. Well, Moon City coming off their first loss. They take on Seattle, the Sounders in Seattle, 9.30 p.m. Central Time tomorrow night. Can't wait to watch the game and break it down with you next week. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be late. You know, it's, it's know, late these, for Easter weekend here, 9.30. Yikes. I'll tell Yikes. you what. These these West Coast times, they just can't deal. It is cool, though, that they opened it up for uh, Apple TV+. Plus. Yes. So if, if you haven't had the opportunity to and you didn't want to do the subscription or any of that, here is yet another opportunity for you to watch it for free. And, uh, and and get into it because it's going to be, again, win, lose, or draw. This is going to be an exciting match. It's the top two teams in the West head-to-head. Hopefully we're talking about yet another city win. Moon and I will be back next week, but until then, energy up and go! Go!